Let's hear me. Yeah, Greg did a pretty good job at recapping everything. I don't have much to add to that. But that's right. Um, I came here for Awana back in 2015, uh, which was a couple of years after I met Andrew Mattis, who was the youth pastor here at the time when I was at middle school, when it was actually right next door. Andrew would come over during our lunch periods and interact with the students and invite them to get plugged in at church. And I got to know him over the course of a couple of years before entering high school, and when I was a freshman, um, I found out I could be involved with the youth ministry here. Um, and that was an amazing opportunity for me to go grow deeper in my faith. Um, a lot of my family is here today, kind of just spread all throughout, so it's good to have all of you here. Um, and I grew up in a Christian home, but when I got plugged into the youth ministry here, that's really when I started to grow and know a lot more about the Lord. And I was involved with the Iwana program here, which I understand is Kids for Truth now. That's pretty awesome. And uh, so I was involved throughout high school, and during that time I also got to go to West Coast Honor Camp, which um, was kind of the end of the year summer camp down in California. And at one of those summer camps is when I gave my life to the Lord, either my freshman or sophomore year. And there's some pictures up on the screen. The top left corner is of myself and Malachi at that camp. Malachi probably hates the fact that I'm showing any photos of him right now. <laughs> He's up there a couple of times. And uh, yeah, and it was so impactful to me um, just to be able to get plugged in here every Thursday night, go deeper in the Word. Jim, Jerry, Larry, um, a few of the guys who are still here today were very impactful in my walk with Christ and really helped me to develop a better understanding of the Lord, which really set the stage for me when I went to OSU. So though I accepted the Lord at a pretty young age in high school, I wasn't necessarily walking it out in the best manner. And I really knew I needed to have a Christ-centered community when I got to college. And I was very surprised that I didn't have to go out of my way and find one because during welcome week of my freshman year, which is kind of like your orientation time, you're trying to figure out where your classes are gonna be. Um, there was a bunch of ministries out on campus tabling um, or inviting new students to join their ministries, and I got invited to Real Life, and they offered free food, which um, if you offer for me free food, I'll probably be there. <laughs> so I got plugged in just about every day of my first week of college, and it really got me involved, which um, then turned into attending their Tuesday night services, studying through the Bible, getting plugged into individual men's small group Bible studies, getting plugged into events, and eventually serving. And um, it was just so amazing to have, um, you know, that consistent community in college, which really helped me to um, work on the parts of my life that weren't necessarily pleasing to the Lord at the time. Um, whether it was, um, you know, hanging out in the dorms and doing things I shouldn't have been doing or some of the things that were unhealthy in my relationship at the time. And it was just amazing to be plugged into small group Bible studies where you could get to know other guys, they get vulnerable, share about their struggles, which a lot of guys shared the same struggles um, in their teenage years and in their 20s. And it really made me uncomfortable with the way that I was living, and I'm very thankful for that because it really encouraged me to grow. And throughout my time in real life, I got plugged in more and more. My life, instead of being kind of double-sided where I had my ministry side of my life and the school side of my life, it all started to turn into one because when you get plugged into a ministry of 200 to 300 students, it sounds like a lot of people, but as you get to know them, I was surprised to see that I started to recognize everybody or I would recognize a few people in every class. So. There was really, you know, no way to hide the ministry side of my life, and there was no way to, you know, not act Christian, because there were people to keep you accountable, and I'm very thankful for that. And uh, so, yeah, I graduated from OSU uh, last spring, and right next to me, that's my lovely wife. We got um, married in 2021, and she came here to Awana, um, the youth group in 2015, I think, as well. So she was here throughout high school with me, and we were high school sweethearts, and 
Yes, we got married after my sophomore year, after she graduated from Lane Community College, and she is so supportive of me in ministry. And we do ministry together. Um, you know, whether or not she's the one actively on campus meeting with students, you know, just the fact that she prays with me and supports with me. And um, yeah, I'm just beyond blessed to have her um, alongside me. And I want to thank you guys also for supporting both of us. Um, without you guys, you know, it wouldn't be possible for us to devote as much time to this as much as we do. So I wanted to talk a little bit more about um, what the real life ministry is. And so we are a group of college students at OSU living to serve Jesus and make him known to others as well. And, you know, we are, you know, welcoming to everybody. There's a lot of people who've walked with the Lord their entire lives. And as you can imagine, there are a lot of students in college who need to hear the gospel message. And we meet every Tuesday night at 8 p.m., which is a deal breaker for a lot of people being that late. <laughs> but the reason it's so late is that um, it won't conflict with any student's classes. And uh, I think if the next slide. Um, yeah, so there's our mission statement. Real life is a community of college students at Oregon State University learning to follow Jesus and share his hope with others. And, um, you know, throughout the week, we have things going on just about every day um, to allow students to get connected, serve, and learn more about Jesus. And this year we're going through the book of Acts. Um, we're hoping to get through the book of Acts by the end of our spring term, but right now we're at Acts 13, and we don't really want to rush through it, so we'll see how it goes. It might cut, carry into our um, summer series as well, um, which, you know, real life really shrinks down when the, the college students aren't around because it is a college town, but we do meet year-round and um, yeah, the summer, summer program is really sweet. If you guys are um, considering going to college, I'm speaking to those of you who are considering college right now. Um, yeah, I really encourage you, whether you're coming to OSU or a different college, get plugged into ministry. It'll be really impactful. We have men's small group Bible studies and women's small group Bible studies. And just a couple of weeks ago, we started a co-ed lunch club at Lynn Menton Community College as well. Um, which is the first time, from my understanding, that we have not just been exclusively OSU. And it's been really cool to be able to have, you know, a brand new group of students to invite into community. And, you know, I was in college throughout COVID, and COVID really led to a lot of students um, getting depressed and not really having community. And there's just been this revival of hunger for that um, now that COVID is mostly behind us anyway, and students are able to meet up again. And over the last two years, we've just seen a hunger for the gospel unlike anything I've ever seen before at OSU. And the ministry has gone from having about 150 students when I first started going to 50 students during COVID to now about 250 students to 300 students on a weekly basis who are just hungry to learn more about the Bible and, you know, it isn't just, you know, showing up on a Tuesday night. Students who are actually hungry to live it out day by day. And uh, over the last few weeks, you know, um, going around just interacting with students on campus, you know, it's funny how just a simple conversation with the gospel message can change someone's life. Um, just recently, there were a few students who I just walked up to randomly, told them about Jesus, and they went from not ever even considering God to then accepting Jesus. And you know, we're seeing that more and more, just students who, um, if they knew, they would um, just really, really, you know, have their life changed. And so, you're probably wondering how I got into the post-college aspect of real life. And it's funny because I was um, working with UPS throughout most of um, college, and my college degree um, was biohealth sciences. And so, College ministry doesn't really, um, isn't a one-to-one -one with either of those things <laughs> necessarily, but it is cool how those have impacted um, me as a campus missionary. So um, I figured out during COVID that the healthcare field is kind of scary and um, not necessarily what I wanted to devote my life to. So then I thought that UPS would be that because, um, you know, 
for a lot of people. It definitely provides for family, and it's something that I would start to, you know, how to do pretty well. So going into last year, I really started to pray about what opportunity, um, where, lo- where the Lord was leading me. And it's interesting because I went from being certain I was going to be a doctor or physician assistant to certain that I was going to be working, driving package car for UPS, to now living out um, most of my um, days of the week on campus at OSU, sharing with students the message of Jesus. And it really just came through a lot of prayer and recognizing um, some of the open doors in my life and the doors that I was not supposed to continue knocking on as the Lord started to close them. And it's not something that I ever thought I'd be doing. You know, if you had asked me one year ago if I thought I'd be continuing on my involvement with real life, I probably would have said, no, I don't think so. I probably want to go make a lot more money. But man, is <laughs> there is so much more that God can have for you besides money. And, um, you know, I would honestly say I'd rather not be doing anything else right now. Just, you know, being able to interact with people who need Jesus or just need encouragement in their walk with Christ is so amazing. It's impactful for them. It's impactful for myself just to see how the Lord is moving. And I really just love what I get to do. And um, yeah, it's, it's really sweet. And I just want to thank you guys once again for making that possible. And of course, I probably don't need to say this, most of you aren't ever going to be a campus missionary at OSU, but you are all having a role in what's going on there by supporting us financially and with your prayer. Um, It's also just really sweet for us to come visit church. Uh, Real Life is the college ministry of Calvary Corvallis, which has about 500 to 600 people on a weekly basis. And you don't really get this dynamic of um, interaction on a, you know, more intimate level where, you know, yes, people can share their prayer, but it might not happen on a Sunday morning. And, um, it's mostly young people as well, and by young I mean like less than 30. I think half of our church um, is people who are in college or fresh out of college because Corvallis is a college town. Um, and it's just really sweet to be with you guys today because um, it mixes it up and reminds us that you know the Church of Christ is much bigger than just what we experience each week in Corvallis. So, um, yeah, um, Real life helped me to discover my giftings and put them into practice. And 2 Timothy 2.2 says, What you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust the faithful men who will be able to teach others also. And that's one of our mission statements as disciplers at OSU um, and in real life. As a freshman and a sophomore, I was receiving a lot from the upper upperclassmen but I wasn't necessarily taking the things that I was reading in the Bible and then applying them to um, share with other students as well. It's like I had a hopeful message, but then I was kind of keeping it to myself. And uh, I would refer to that as getting fat on the word, (laughs) which um, you just, you're consuming all the time and you aren't necessarily working it out and putting it into practice. But Jesus' discipleship model is all about taking the things you've learned and entrusting them to others. And it's a multiplication sort of model rather than addition. It's not me learning something and then I'm a plus one and then I let one other person know and they're a plus one, but it's this ongoing thing where I take the things I've learned, I pass it on to others, they then go take that to the other people. And then that's how we get to where the church is today where Jesus is known all throughout the world. And, you know, our hope is that he would continue to be known throughout all of the nations. So, God is doing incredible things at OSU, but I believe he's doing amazing things here in Glide as well. And being a campus missionary doesn't necessarily make me more special or more valuable an asset to the kingdom of God than any of you. All of you can also have a special role just where you are. So today we're going to be going through Romans 12, if you guys want to go there. Some of you, it's a holy iPhone, so you might have to scroll there necessarily. (laughs) 
I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For the by, for by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity that we have today to have fellowship with one another, Lord, and to just recognize you and give you space in our life. Father, I pray that as we go through your word today, Lord, that you would just continue to transform us, Lord, that you would minister to us directly. Father, that as we read through your word, we would understand what it is that you want us to know, how you want us to live our lives, to glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name, amen. So Romans is a letter of Paul, also known as epistle, and throughout the New Testament, it is a lot of um, letters given to churches, and also Titus and Timothy are referred to as pastoral epistles. And they have a lot of parallel content, whether it be exhortation, clarification, warnings, how to conduct fellowship, leadership, and serving. Various churches needed the same guidance. That's why as you read through Romans 12 and Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 12, there's a lot of, you know, kind of one-to-ones, and it's because though the Roman church and a lot of these churches had Christ, they still needed instruction on how that plays out in community. What's interesting about the, the book of Romans is that Paul wishes that he could have delivered this information in person, and Oftentimes when he would send a letter is because it just wasn't possible for him to travel to that area, whether it be um, God's will or, you know, his plans getting fooled. (laughs) But if Paul had been able to, he might have gone to Rome and shared this message in person, and we might not have it in Scripture today. You know, just the fact that Paul probably would have gone and shared it in person, but... um, you know, it ended up in letter form. That's certainly, you know, from my perspective, probably part of God's divine plan so that we could also have this message here today. And, you know, I would encourage you to read the book of Romans. It's one of my favorites. And it really just, you know, it really uh, amplifies the gospel of Christ and shows how we can apply it to our own lives. In Romans 12, Um, you see that word therefore, and therefore means that you kind of have to understand what comes before it in order to understand it. Um, When you see the word therefore, you should ask what what it's there for. (laughs) And if you read Romans 1 through 11, you'd see this um, message by Paul about the Gentiles being grafted into the faith, this extension of God's mercy and grace and his appeal to them to devote and dedicate a life to God, which is a reasonable response to Christ giving his life that we might live. And throughout that time, the mercies of God that he mentions have to do with being justified, forgiven, reconciled, receiving Christ's righteousness, and adopted into the faith as children of God. And all of those things come through God's mercy, not through something that we have done. And for those reasons, we should obey God's greatest commandment, which is seen in Mark 12, 30. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. Paul here in this message is appealing, or he says beseech, which is this eager, anxious, 
anxious request for them to make a decision to have a committed relationship with God, to be all in. God is personal, and he wants a personal relationship with us. Now, he says to be a living sacrifice, and sacrifice isn't necessarily referring to us physically laying down our life, and it says living, which sacrifice is a picture of offering the whole self to God. And in this case, it's out of a response rather than a petition, you know? When you think about animal sacrifice, it's more in the form of we are doing this in order to have covering for our sin. This is our sins have been covered, therefore I am going to walk out my life as a living sacrifice. And throughout verses 1 and 2, you see this um, urge that we, this urge that Paul has for the church that they have a submission of body, thoughts, and will. Because when we are submitted to God, he can then use us for his purposes and we can have perfect relationship with him. Living for God looks a few ways. One, it's to lose our life, the selfish life that we want to have for ourselves, which um, is very self-oriented. I want to have money. I want to have a really good job. I want to have comfort. It's to lay that aside because God has something better. It's to pick up your cross. It's not necessarily going to be comfortable. And it's also to crucify the flesh, those desires which are contrary to the will of God. Here, Paul is saying that as a living sacrifice, we should be holy. And holy is to be set apart, to be perfect just like God, to be consecrated, if you want to know a new special fancy word, that's to be set apart. The believer is already made holy in Christ, as we read in Hebrews 10, and we should live our lives in such a way that reflects that. This is a reasonable response to God, or our spiritual worship. A spiritual worship is not necessarily just music. Worship is can be in music form, as we saw up here um, just a few minutes ago. But worship is to recognize God for who he is and what he has done, and to respond out of gratitude, reverence, and obedience to him. That certainly can look like music, but we can just worship God in every aspect of our life as well. As you read verse 2, it says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. These words conformed and transformed both have that same word in the middle, form. And it's this idea that we are all formable. We are all impressionable. The things that we spend our time around impact us in ways beyond even how we really think it can. I recently uh, saw a commercial for VidAngel. Some of you guys know what that is. It's a video service that will take away explicit content. And the commercial starts with somebody getting shot with a paintball. And I don't know if you guys play paintball, but paintballs don't hurt super bad, but if you get pelleted with a lot of them, it really hurts. And it was this idea that, you know, as we watch even movies or certain types of media, you know, a swear word here, a swear word there, something you didn't even, you know, necessarily set out to look at, you know, after time, as those things add up, they do impact us. And um, you guys can all see this just in the ways that you interact with people, the media that you consume, you know, what you see when you're on social media. Um, If you've ever gone hunting with Malachi and Jacob, um, (laughs) you might start to notice that they they take on this sort of accent, which is really funny, or if you watch their videos. And (laughs) if I go out and hunt with them, I find myself also starting to take on that that hunting accent as well. I was also praying with a group of students recently, and it was funny because they all started to pray in King James Version, and I was just like, what is going on? 
But that's to say, it's not even necessarily something we're trying to do. Our minds just automatically do it. Our minds conform to what we spend our time with. And the world is competing for our attention. In fact, advertising is a very profitable industry, and that's why you get ads all the time. I think, on average, we all consume about 700 advertisements a day or something like that, and it just adds up, and we don't even know it, and then subconsciously, we want certain things that we didn't want before. So I ask you, how much time do you spend with God? If we want to be conformed to his image, we should be spending more time with him than we are around the things that we don't want to be conformed into. And when we spend more time or more focus on things than God, that can be an idol in our lives. And, um, you know, you might not notice it until it's been there for a little while and it starts to become a real issue. And so if you guys are, you know, here at church for the first time or you guys maybe spend you know, one day in the Word each week, I would encourage you to spend more time in the Word, more time with God, and you will be impacted um, simply as a result of spending more time with Him. C.H. Spurgeon said, Love for God is obedience. Love for God is holiness. To love God and to love man is to be conformed to the image of Christ, and this is salvation. In James 4.4, It says, you adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. 1 John 2, 15 through 16 says, do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. If we loved God with all our mind, there wouldn't be any mind left for the things of the world because they are quite contrary. And when it says lust of the flesh and lust of the eyes, those are those corrupted things and those corrupted desires that give birth to sin in our life, which further separates us from him and certainly does not please him to see us walking out our lives in that way. This world hates Jesus because he brings light to the darkness and exposes wickedness, which we see in John chapter 3. The world is in opposition with God. So where do you draw your line in your participation with it? When we receive Christ, God gives us a renewed mind and heart. And... Through the Holy Spirit, we can discern the will of God, which is good, acceptable, and perfect. If we go on to verse 3, it says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. Before he talks about how to participate in the body of Christ, it's a message of humility. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought to. In other words, know your place and also keep in mind the mercies of God, those things that you do deserve and those things that you've received that you don't deserve. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. We don't deserve any of the blessings we receive in our life. And if we had that in mind, we would never be able to boast about the things that we like about ourselves because everything good and perfect is a gift from God. Faith itself is granted by God. And Paul is speaking out of this lens of grace. The Corinthian church needed the same warning in chapter 4 of 1 Corinthians because some were getting puffed up in their feeling of being more favorable in the image of God or through the eyes of God than other people in the church who may not have had as much faith. Paul says, what do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if you did not 
receive it. Grace and mercy are undeserved, unmerited favor. Giftings are also not distributed based on merit. We shouldn't compare ourselves, and pride is the result of comparison. So if you are comparing yourselves with others and looking at yourself more highly than you ought to, you aren't understanding the point of the whole grace, mercy, and giftings that God has given. 1 Corinthians 12.11 says, All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. There's nothing that we can do to receive these giftings from God because if we earned them, then they wouldn't be gifts anymore. They would be wages. So giving God the glory is a serious matter. It's funny because we've been going through Acts 12 um, last week or the week before that, and you see um, how, just how seriously God takes giving him the glory when you see King Herod um, at the end of chapter 12 receive glory from people, and I think they start to say, the voice of God and not of a man, and Herod doesn't give glory to God, and God strikes him down right there, and it says he's then eaten by worms. (laughs) And though that might necessarily be descriptive and it might not happen to you in your chair today, it is just a reminder that we are to give God the glory. You might also be wondering, why should I live a life that blesses and honors God? Because we are created for that very purpose. Everything that's created, whether it's the stars, animals, the earth, and even ourselves, we are all created to bring glory to him and for us specifically to have relationship with him. It's also not about us at all. In Matthew 5, 16, it says, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. When we do our good works, it should point to God and God should receive the glory. C.S. Lewis said, humility is not thinking less of yourself, it's thinking of yourself less. 1 Corinthians 12, 4 through 7 said, now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit, and there are varieties of service, but the same Lord, and there are varieties of activities, but it it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, and Ephesians 4 all give this non-exhaustive list of what those giftings of the Spirit can look like, whether it be prophecy, serving, teaching, exhortation, giving, leadership, acts of mercy, word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, distinguishing between spirits, tongues, interpretations of tongues, prophets, evangelists, and shepherds. It can look a lot of different ways. And some of us might have multiple of those giftings. Some of us may only have a few. In verse 6, Paul is encouraging the Romans church to use those giftings. The church is referred to or likened to a body. And the church is the body of Christ. refer to body parts to kind of describe how the church should function with their giftings. Some are the feet, some are the arms, some are the hands, and I don't know about you guys, but I think I might be the stomach. Uh, (laughs) And just like a body, you can't have a functional unit if you just have one thing. If it was just my leg or just my foot, well, good luck. But it really takes, you know, two legs, a torso, arms, and a head in order for things to actually carry out. 1 Corinthians 12, 18 through 27 says, But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, 
which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. Different parts of the body play different roles, but with a united purpose to glorify God. The giftings complement one another. In Ephesians chapter 4, 11 through 16, it says, And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body in Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes. Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. Something cool that you see through here as it's working through this body analogy is that Christ is the head. He's the center of the whole thing. He makes the whole thing work. And he also, like we can use our brains to tell our hand to do something, you know, God, Jesus, can tell us to do something and then we should respond. And if we don't respond, or if I tell my hand to move and my hand doesn't move, then something's off. (laughs) And it's kind of the same way with us as a church. We all have a part to play. God doesn't want us to just come to church. He wants us to be the church. You don't have to do any of this. You get to do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. And it's not about, you know, I don't want to do that, or necessarily if you do the action and it's not out of place of wanting to. God is looking for a heart posture that is responsive to him and wants to willingly serve him. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each has received a gift, Use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. By the grace of God, he allows us to participate in his works. We are instruments in his hand. You know, if God is the carpenter, we are the hammer or we are the nails. You know, God's the one doing the work and we're simply instruments in his hand to help him get it done. And it's like he's the... Infinity and we're like the little piece, right? I think I heard this um, analogy where there's this elephant and this mouse walking on a bridge. Have you ever think about those rope bridges? And the bridge is really swinging back and forth. And then they get to the other side and the mouse looks up to the elephant and goes, wow, we really rocked that bridge. (laughs) And the elephant just laughs because God's the big part. So I ask you, what gifts and resources are you stewarding? There's a few things that we all steward as believers in Christ. If you're a believer, you are a steward of the gospel. At the end of Matthew, at the start of Acts, and in other areas, Jesus says to go and make disciples. It's the great commission, not the great suggestion. We are to walk that out. It's something we're called to do. Bring the message of salvation to mankind. He's entrusted that to us as disciples to go and do throughout the world. If you have the gospel message, you have something others need. Might not even realize they do need it. We have that light, that message of hope that could transform their life. It's the message that brings salvation unto men. Romans 10, 14 through 15 says, How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how should they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings of good things. It is good news. Because there is bad news. And if they do not have the gospel of Christ, you have that good thing that they need. 
Another thing that we all share as believers is time. Now that might be to varying degrees, but unless something changes here in the next two seconds, I would say we all have time right now. Colossians 4, 5 says to walk in wisdom toward outsiders making the best use of the time. We are all stewards of time. And we should use that time to glorify God. Also, in Timothy, which is one of those pastoral epistles, you see reminder after reminder from Paul to Timothy because people are forgetful. To Timothy, on, in multiple verses, he just gives these reminders. 1 Timothy 4.14, he says, Do not neglect the gift you have. In 1 Timothy 6.20, he says, O Timothy, guard the deposit entrusted to you. 2 Timothy 1.14, By the Holy Spirit who dwells within us, guard the good deposit entrusted to you. 2 Timothy 1.6, For this reason I remind you to fan into flame the gift of God. That consuming fire song that we sang during worship had that phrase, fan into flame the Spirit of God. And that's what we are all to do in our life. And we often need reminders to do that. And, you know, as humans, we're probably still going to need reminders day after day. Oh yeah, there's much more to today than eating food and sleeping. We can use our life for something that is eternal, building up the kingdom of God. We are all stewards of prayer. We can all pray for one another and we can all communicate with God through prayer. Don't neglect that. 1 Corinthians 12 talks about not everybody being pastors, not everybody being evangelists, not everybody being, uh, you know, carrying out acts of mercy. Not everybody are worship leaders. However, we shouldn't think less of ourselves because of it. God can use us all in special, unique ways. You might have to wonder, do I have to quit what I'm doing to become a missionary? No. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 24 says, So brothers, in whatever condition each was called, there let him remain with God. We are to live it out where we are and be open to opportunities Specifically, in 1 Corinthians, when Paul is saying that, he's saying, if you're a bondservant and freedom is offered to you, take the opportunity for freedom and then glorify God through that. But if you're a servant, to glorify God in that. It's funny because uh, with real life, a lot of the college students who start to really get excited about ministry want to quit school and devote you know, all of their attention to doing mission work. Um, but we encourage them to remain in school because they have access to students because of that. By being in the classrooms, they have a mission field opportunity, which we might not have as non-students. I still work at UPS for a few reasons, and that's a mission field in itself. When we think mission trip, we often think international, like I have to raise a lot of money and go overseas. But realistically, we all have a mission field. We're all around people who don't have the gospel of Christ. And if we were to take those opportunities and be obedient to them, God can do amazing things with you, through you. Now, I'm talking a lot about serving. But when I think of serving, I'm always reminded of the passage with Mary and Martha, in which Jesus says that Mary has chosen the good portion. To spend time at the feet of Jesus is more important than serving. We are to present, him, present to him ourselves entirely, not just servitude. We should bestow to him our attention, our heart, our, you know, if we, if we want anything in our lives, we should first bring it to him. Personal time with God is necessary. Serving is good, but it should come from an overflow of what we have received from him, rooted in the love of God. Love of God and service for him are mutually reinforcing. 
though sitting at the feet of God is more important than serving him, they're complementary with one another. Once you have sat at his feet, you can then have an overflow that goes out to others. You cannot have an overflow if you do not have an inflow. Our pastor at Calvary Corvallis, Rob, says, our time alone with God should exceed the time we spend serving or worshiping in the presence of others. How many marriages have we seen affected by a spouse who overworks? It begins out of a good intention to provide for family, but it can quickly lead to neglecting quality time and losing sight of what is most important. God leads us to spend time with him, and this can take many forms, whether it's reading scripture, worshiping, praying, etc. In summary of what we read through Romans 12 today, it continues to talk about how we can live our lives in such a way that glorifies God. But in these first verses, we are to give ourselves to God fully, worship him first and foremost, let him transform you and align your will with his, have a right view of yourself and your role in the body, Steward the unique giftings he has given you for edification of self and of the body of Christ. There is also a cost of discipleship. In the epistles that we're reading, Romans 12, Corinthians, is often bookended by a warning that it's not going to be easy. In fact, it's going to be difficult to live our lives out for God. Otherwise, we'd all be doing it already. We have to count the cost as disciples of Jesus. We all have responsibilities as disciples of Christ to love him and to make him known to others. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just come before you once again to just ask that you would transform us, Lord, into your image, that we can glorify you in all that we do, and Lord, that we can have a personal relationship with you. Lord, that we would desire you more day by day. And Father, I pray that we would receive opportunities to work with you in building the kingdom of God here on earth, Lord. That we can share the good news with others who have not received it, Lord. To to have eyes to see others the way that you see them, Lord. To be open to opportunities that you have for us, Lord, and to react on them. Lord, we pray for boldness. We pray for strength. Lord, I also just pray that if there's anything that we walk away from here remembering this morning, that it would be your word. Lord, that we would just commit to our hearts the words of life, Lord, that you've given us. Lord, we pray that as we go out, we would be lights in this world, Lord, that we would point others to you in whatever whatever way we are to do that, Lord, whether it's as a teacher, as an evangelist, as a worship leader. Lord, I pray that you would all use us in a unique way, and Lord, that we could devote our lives to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Thanks, Nemo. Thanks, Nemo. Hold on up here for a second. couple things, though, uh, I wanted to say that actually were going through my head as you're speaking about this, because Romans 12 is actually one of my favorite chapters in Scripture. Yeah, and my favorite verse is Romans 12, too. One, actually, verse 1 and 2. But one of the things I was thinking about is you said that you made a comment about getting fat on the Word of God. Great analogy, right? Because there's a difference between getting fat on the Word and just sitting in that and then using that as nourishment to actually exercise out that faith. Totally different. That's a different thing. Yeah, and the fact that... Uh, we are called to be part of the body. And one of the things that's always hit me about this whole topic of the body of Christ and spiritual gifts is I have a role to play in that body. You have a role to play in that body. I can't fit your role and you can't fit mine. And that's, that's you know, if, and if I don't part, I'm actually letting you down. <clears throat> so I, I, you know, part of that to me I was thinking is, you know, that's part of the challenge for all of us is as believers, you and I, we're called to be part of the body. We're part to fit into our, we're called to fit into our role, to be Greg, to be Nemo, right, as individuals. And that's, that's why I, I love your topic because the calling in this is huge. 
for each one of us. And it's awesome to know that, you know, you're, you have stepped out in faith to fit into the role that God has called you at OSU to share, to share Christ with people, to minister to students. I mean, I, you know, we always talk about how dark the whole, you know, the college scene is, the high school scene is, but, I mean, you, you, you can agree or disagree at this. You let me know. But there is something pretty powerful going on at colleges right now. Christ is moving at the college level. And, you know, what you're doing is just is powerful. And I'm glad you're right where, right where God is moving. And may he continue to use you to minister to those people. And, you know, may he move in such a way where the ministry explodes. Because people, the, the college scene, the college people, high school students are hungry for something. And they're looking for it. Because they knew, they know underneath, underneath it all, that there is something that is not right in this world. There's, there's lies being given to them, and they're hungry for what that truth is, and they're looking for it. Um, so I got a, uh, a, a question here, a couple questions, real quick. What are three things that we could be praying for you guys with your ministry? Yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> Why um, I asked it? <laughs> number one. Um, I was mentioning that we do a teaching every Tuesday night. Um, our college pastor was planning on teaching this Tuesday night, but he might have COVID. So if you could be praying for his healing, um, otherwise I'll be teaching on Tuesday night, which awesome. We'll see what happens, but, um, he's been planning on teaching. So you guys could be praying for him just a couple of weeks ago. Um, I think there was a photo we might be able to pull up. We had what we call all campus worship and there's about 13 evangelical Christian ministries on campus. And yeah, there it is. And we all got oh, to be together in the same room, a little over a thousand of us. Um, which, you know, you could look at that as a big number or you're like, oh, only 3% of campus. But it was powerful to be there. And we're, uh, just praying that a lot of these students who found out about it for the first time will get plugged into one of these ministries. And thirdly, we're in the second half of this school year, and um, a lot of the current leaders are raising up younger leaders. And if you guys could be praying that those leaders would then be ready to go to raise up the next generation of students next year. Yeah, we'd appreciate that. Uh, that's awesome. That, that's good stuff right there. <clears throat> It, and uh, for you personally, is there something we could be praying for you? <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. Um, yeah. Um, that I just be able to love my wife better, have more quality time with her. You know, I don't want her to receive the the ti the, the tired side of me when I come home from meeting with students all day. And um, yeah. She's my first ministry, right? <laughs> yeah. God first, marriage, then ministry with the college students. And, you know, I need to keep that priority list great. Thanks for spanking me right now. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> but no, that, that, you know, I, I, and I, you know, we should be praying that for each other, but that is a good thing to be praying for guys that are out doing that kind of stuff because it does, it does sap you. It is, when, when you get up here and preach, when you go out and you minister to people, you're not fighting, you're not just ministering people, you're actually fighting a war because you have the enemy of God who is going to be there to be pushing against, and there's an emotional sapping that happens, if you will, especially over time, and uh, no, that's, a, that's, that's important stuff to be praying so we shall be praying for you for that. Thank you. So if we can, um, I'm going to pray for you guys real quick. And then uh, then the board, the missions committee, we'll be heading over to the fellowship hall to have lunch with these guys and, um, and then go from there. Father, thank you, God, for Nemo. Thank you for his heart, Lord, what you've done in him and through him. Lord, we thank you for the lives that have been changed because he responded to you. Lord, we thank you for the grace that you've poured out upon him. Uh, and, Lord, we pray that the power of Christ would continue to grow within him because of his hunger and thirst for your word, his love for you. And, Lord, uh, you know, I, I do want to pray for him that he would love his wife more. God, that she would receive the, uh, the special parts of him. Um, and, Lord, their time together would be uh, powerful um, and very intentional together.
Lord, I pray that for all of us, all of us men, that we would take that to heart, that we would understand truly what that means, that that is our calling, that is our first and foremost place to be, is to be loving our family and to love them well and love them uh, with the love of Christ. And God, just as he said, we have got to go to you first. We have got to be poured into by you so that we can overflow the things of you onto those around us that we love. Lord, I pray for this ministry of these guys, of real life ministry, Lord, the Tuesday night ministry, that it would continue to grow, that there would be power in it. You'd watch over it, give him protection. But Lord, also for the college pastor, that you would bring healing to his body. And Lord, for all those thousand students that showed up from the 13 different ministries that were connected to this, we do ask God that there would be connections, that there would be people that would be plugged into those ministries, that their eyes would be open to it, Lord. And for every single one of those uh, people that get plugged in, that they would also be a conduit for the love of Christ to those around them that would grow those ministries so that more people would hear about Christ and just fall into love with you, God. And Lord, also for this next generation that's coming up behind uh, those that are in leadership right now, we pray that you would uh, ri- raise them up. Lord, there would always be an idea and a mentality that to pass on the baton to those behind them. And Lord, to do it well, to encourage them, to empower them, and God, to, uh, to um, give them the freedom to minister. But Lord, that we would be in prayer for them. We would be the support that they need as they then put their feet into the, into, onto the uh, pavement and put their hands to the plow, God. Lord, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this message, that we would be challenged by it, Lord, that we would uh, uh, be challenged by the fact that to love you well is to step into um, what you've called us to do, God. Um, just be with us as we go today, um, and Lord, for all that you are doing uh, in, in Nemo and his wife's life and just all those that are around him. We praise you for that. In your son's name, amen. All right, have a good rest of the day, and we'll see you guys later.